so second presentation today is going to be about uh, Valve and, and their recent announcements uh, in the you know field of video games. And uh, who here knows about Valve? Almost everybody. Since some people don't know about Valve, I thought a uh, proper introduction would be due. So Valve has been a game developer for more than uh, 15 years now. And they have uh, been developing a number of very famous high-profile games, such as Half-Life, uh, Portal, like, you know, famous kind of puzzle game in 3D, in which you create portals through walls, and, uh, and you're actually, uh, you know, basically moving through uh, kind of dimensions. And also Left 4 Dead, which is a kind of shooter, uh, multiplayer, uh, in which you actually you shoot zombies, so like you know surfing on the on the kind of zombie brain that's been popular in the past few years. And the Dota, which is a it's kind of real-time strategy game uh, that's been you know pretty famous and popular among gamers in the past few years. But on top of that, they've been very very famous uh, for the success in developing a tool which is Steam. Um, as you may know, it's a digital distribution service uh, where you can actually buy games online directly, and you just simply, uh, you know, order, and you download directly to your PC or your Mac or recently your Linux PC as well, and you can directly play without having to buy a CD or you know install anything by itself. So it's very practical and convenient, and they published their first game this way, uh, like Half-Life 2, uh, when they wanted to start the service. <coughs> And then progressively, they put on board many other publishers and, uh, and developers, and now it's become a huge uh, service that has 50 million 5.0 uh, registered users, and uh, that picks about 6 million ongoing users, like you know, actively present on the service. So it's really big, and it's actually a private company. They they're not in uh, you know in the stock exchange or anything, so it's they they own the profits and everything. And this is what the client looks like. Uh, this is a picture I took few days ago on my you know, Linux PC. And as you can see, this is the one of the latest version of the clients. And you can actually you know, see the game they're selling, buy there, and you have different categories, recommendations, and so on. And so I mentioned this. They just uh, developed the Linux version of these clients uh, since earlier this year. And they made uh, about 217 games available since then. Uh, in just about like nine months, uh, so it's um, they've been growing pretty fast in that Linux segment. And recently, in the past uh, couple of weeks, um, they've been announcing their intention to bring Steam as a service into the Linux because, as you can imagine, um, this service was used to be on the kind of office PC, so not really in the place where you're playing. Um, but now they want to bring that service more to where people will be comfortable to play in a kind of familiar environment when you're used to playing games like console and so on. And so to do this kind of objective, um, they went to um, announce three things. First thing is they're developing uh, OS, called SteamOS, uh, which is based on Linux, and basically you're going to run this OS and directly arrive into the interface of Steam. So you don't have to deal with you know launching the US and then clicking on Steam and so on anymore. It's just very convenient. Um, then they will launch the Steam machines. So Steam machine basically is hardware that is made to run the Steam OS. And and there um, again it's convenience. You have a machine that's made for that. So you don't have to worry about what to put in, what kind of hardware to put, and you can directly run your games at the right speed. We hope uh, at the right configuration and so on. So that's again another element. And uh, the last element was introducing their controller. Um, as you may have seen it, it's kind of a very strange controller because it doesn't look like the usual game pad that we have on the other machines. Uh, you have these two kind of trackpad, like an haptic feedback trackpad, that's actually used for both of your thumbs to move around. And what it does actually it gives you much more precision when you're moving, like comparable to a mouse. Uh, versus, you know, usual thumb pads and so on. So the idea is you want to bridge the kind of PC games with this kind of controller on your TV uh, without having to use the mouse and the keyboard. And in the middle, they have a touch screen that can allow you to have special commands depending on the game you're playing. So there's a number of points that, that's interesting to talk about, I think, about this announcement. And one of them is like, why did they move to a Linux, uh, you know, operating system? First, because it's free. Um, it's, I think it's obvious, but you know, you think about it, you don't want to depend on paying a license to somebody else 
when you want to develop your own machine on your platform. So obvious reason to go for Linux, you don't have to pay anybody to use it. But it's also free as in freedom, which is here through uh, Richard Stallman. Uh, you can actually uh, you know, tailor Linux to your own needs, you can remove the packages you don't need for you know, gaming, and answer you don't need for Office, and put the one in for gaming, and so on. And you don't have to worry about, you know, again, asking permission for anybody to do that. And uh, that, that enables you uh, a lot of flexibility, how you want to shape your system, um, how fast it's going to load, and so on. So it's, it's very practical for that purpose as well. On top of that, Linux has been uh, gathering more and more support for hardware vendors regarding the drivers. And uh, you see like the major like uh, companies like Nvidia, AMD, and Intel have been actually pushing more and more drivers in the past uh, couple of years, maybe like more like a couple of months now, uh, to improve their performance of the drivers on Linux. And um, now you see that, except for AMD, uh, most of them actually are on par with the performance you have on Windows, uh, and even actually uh, maybe superior in some aspects for Nvidia. So you have the hardware there that's available, that's high performing, so you can actually play the same kind of games that you expect uh, on the other platforms. On the software side, you also have a number of you know, tools that are available directly uh, to use for this. <laughs> Unity 3D is an engine that's made um, to uh, support cross-platform compatibility, and you can actually also develop uh, you know, for Linux with this. And even though I think it's not official yet, there's already support for Linux, and you, you can already use it. And many games have been released uh, using Unity for Linux as well. You also have the Unreal Engine um, that's been used recently for Painkiller. Uh, that's been released a couple of weeks or months ago, I think. Uh, and that's working, you know, again, fine on, on Linux. Um, and you also have, of course, the, the Source Engine from Valve, which is running to, uh, you know, to play Portal and Half-Life 2 and all those kind of games using the latest uh, Source Engine. And of course, the main reason is that uh, they don't want to be dependent on Microsoft. Um, because who knows what's going to happen in like five years, ten years down the road? Who knows like how long the PC for Microsoft is going to remain an open platform? It could remain as it is currently, but it also could be like turning into something like uh, you know iOS, where you have a single app store and you have to ask the permission to you know to sell your applications on it. And if they ever go that way, you know that's the death of Steam. So uh, nobody knows how likely this is going to be, um, but that's one risk that you know, I think Valve is aware of, and they're trying to you know, mitigate as they move forward with their, with their own platform. But the dilemma that they have, and you can imagine, is that you know, with the six million like, concurrent players currently playing on Steam as we speak, 95% of them actually using Windows PCs. So you're going to a situation when you are, you are actually asking your gamers to go to a system which is not what they use currently. And on top of that, um, you know, we often see this kind of graph showing like, you know, Windows is actually losing share year after year versus, you know, the other operating system. If you consider Android, iOS as, you know, com competitive uh, operating system as well. And that gives you an impression that Windows is actually, you know, becoming very, very small on the market. Um, the problem with this kind of graph is that it doesn't tell you everything because it just gives you an impression that it's a single cake and the cake is the same size and you know the windows is progressively like diminishing and becoming smaller and smaller. But this is not really the case. The cake is a lie. Uh, you actually have to think it's, it's a growing cake over time. It's not like it's replacing the existing um, hardware you know, kind of platform. It's actually growing over time. You have more and more devices being sold. So whenever somebody tells you like iOS is going to kill the PC, it's just bullshit. It's not killing anything at all. You see desktop and laptop actually selling pretty much the same as before. Uh, but you have much more uh, of the you know, tablets and smartphones being sold that's being added on top of that existing hardware. So what's happening actually is that many people here are actually using many different type of devices. You're using a tablet, you're using a smartphone, you're using a PC at home as well. So it's becoming a fragmented kind of hardware where people are using different device, different devices for different moments during the day and different usage. Uh, where before it used to be only PC for everything. So now you see like this kind of fragmentation in usage and, and also you see it in the sales as you can see here. And of course, you know, there's some indication that the PC market may be declining a little, but it's still very much you know kind of the same as before. 
Um, however, you know, you clearly have the indication that the number of people who are actually using tablets are spending less time on their PCs because you know they're replacing the usage, some of the usage of the PC they had before, with um, you know the tablet, and they're using you know more and more you know tablets for kind of easy and convenience tasks, and they're spending more time with these kind of devices. And here you can see that the tablets are actually very much used as a consumption devices. Whenever you're browsing, whenever you're doing social networking like Facebook, whatever, uh, you tend to use, these people tend to use more like the tablets than you use a PC because you know, it's faster and you have it everywhere on you. But whenever you have to create contents, of course the PC is still the, the weapon of the choice. Um, so where Valve I think, wants to play here is they want to bring back the PC as a convenient platform to play. And their solution is basically the Steam OS and the Steam machine and the Steam you know, controller. And they want to bring this power out and kind of gather that so uh, that these users again, uh, we used to be playing maybe now there's more on the, on the mobile <laughs> devices than they're playing on PC. And now you can wonder what's their path for growth there? Are they going to source like users from the you know the console, like from the Xbox One, from the PS4? Honestly, I don't think so because uh, most of these gamers they're actually console gamers. And if you ask them like, what do you think about Steam? They're like, ah, what's Steam? I never heard about it. Most of them have never heard. I mean, of course, some of you here know Steam and so on, but most people are actually playing only on consoles and would never play on PC, they have no idea what Steam is. You don't see it on TV, you don't see it in print magazine, you don't see it on the web, unless you go on the website itself. It's invisible to this whole category of gamers who, who actually never exposed to it. So um, these gamers are not going to be going to that kind of devices or the kind of uh, you know, platform they offer. On the opposite, I think this is really more, they're targeting the current Steam users. And they want to bring them to the living room, literally, as I said before. They want to bring the experience of Steam in the living room and ask them to play at home now in their you know, bigger environment, not just in front of the office PC. And this is, I think, kind of organic growth strategy. By bringing the PC gamers in the living room, what they want to do is they want people to spend more time in front of their you know, gaming equipment, where they can only focus on gaming. Because when you're playing on your PC, you can stop playing and then start doing something else. And maybe you're not going to spend as much time gaming as you, know, as you would. But if you're on a console that's only doing gaming, you're more likely to do it only you know, for one hour or two hours, whatever. And more time mean more games played and more sales for Steam potentially as well. So that's one of the ways they can grow by you know, allocating more time of usage through you know, this kind of exclusive living room environment through Steam. But Question. Yeah, sure. Um, so remind me how they make money from. So they make money currently by so they are distributing <laughs> games from other publishers or other developers, and they get a commission every sale. So they get a percentage, just like Apple or Google does on their sales. Work. So the more games they sell, the more money they make. <laughs> so this strategy is also um, a user-based growth strategy because if you put the PC in the living room, what happens is that people who are not Steam gamers, they are going to come and use this as well. So if you are like married, you have your wife is going to play with it. If you have kids, they're going to maybe play with it as well. And you have more and more people who can be exposed to this kind of system, even though they were not even aware of Steam in the first place. Uh, so the idea there is that you will have this family sharing function. And those functions actually have been revealed very, very, um, and not very long ago, uh, by Valve as well. And I think it's very much tied in together with the whole concept of living room sharing. Uh, because they want people to be able to share the games together. And, you know, then they can play with you know, their, their own kind of portfolio of games. And then they will be exposed to the fact that there is a catalog of games available that you know, they can actually buy and further play. And if you have like maybe a boy or a daughter at home, like maybe they will play different kind of games and they will want to buy other games than you know their sister or brother may be playing. So there you have more people on Steam that will be you know growing further the platform and the number of games sold. But obviously this strategy is not going to be something very fast. Um, I really think this is a kind of slow growing, slow growth strategy. Um, they want to start small. Um, they're starting only with 200, you know, kind of game on Linux. Um, they don't want to, to make it very big. They, they, they don't have the marketing power of, you know, 
juggernauts like uh, Microsoft or, or, or Sony. So there's no way they're going to scrum the market and take everything from one day to another. Uh, just like they did at the beginning of Steam, they will start with you know something small, Half-Life 2, maybe a, a few major games that will help launch the platform. But they will progressively grow and gather traction among users. And I think it's very much a um, diversification strategy. Avoid putting your eggs in the same basket. Um, they just want to avoid being stuck down the road in five years, ten years later, with you know maybe Microsoft closing the platform and you know preventing them from doing their business as usual. Uh, and the best way to do that is to see now, prepare for the future, and you know try to have an open door to you know to have an exit in case something like that happens. So what next? Um, if you're selling a video game platform, the most important thing you want to sell is games. And as I mentioned, they only have about 200 games currently, and most of them are actually indie games. So there's very few like AAA titles. So it's very hard to convince gamers to buy a new equipment if you have nothing really major and nothing very exclusive either. Um, so they have to work on that. And they're already securing a lot of high-profile indie games, like Monaco, which is a very famous uh, indie game that's won many awards in the past uh, couple of years, even before it came out, actually. Uh, and it's just been released a couple of days ago on Linux. Uh, and you know, this, this kind of game will probably gather some good traction because uh, that's what people want to play. But of course, you need AAA games. Uh, and you've seen that um, Metro developers uh, have actually announced Metro Last Light, which is one of the high profile FPS for PC, Windows PC until now. Uh, and it will be out by the end of the year on Linux as well. That's probably the first game, non Valve, that's going to be uh, you know, kind of AAA standards. Uh, for the Linux uh, in the platform. And you have also the ROM uh, Total War developers that have been you know, being very strong supporters of the Steam for Linux uh, in very recent announcements. And they think they will bring those games as well to the platform. So these games actually are their million series. Uh, when it came in the UK, it sold one million in it in one week. So it's, it's a huge kind of game that will gather a lot of traction as well. So if you have this kind of couple of very strong games together, coming out you know, in a couple of months, that could gather already a kind of base of users to start with. Do you know if these developers are doing anything special for the Steam controller? They actually they, they showcased uh, Run Total War 2 with the Steam controller. Uh, and they said that they haven't changed anything for it uh, when they did that demonstration. But they, they said it's trivial for them to modify the control to make it work even better. So apparently, it's not something that they are, aware of, uh, they are afraid of. And could be, of course, you know, the ace in the card, Life Life 3. What if they make it an exclusive for like six months or something, or one year, or not, who knows? That could be a way when you can, you know, play the power of Valve behind the platform. Uh, I'm not sure, I don't know if they really want to do this kind of thing, because that could be hurting their business as well. Uh, but it's always an option that they have. Uh, and I was expecting them to release this kind of announcement when they, you know, when they did the SteamOS kind of, you know, news. But they... Uh, refrain from it. I'm not sure what they want to do later on, but you know, that's potentially a, a way to increase the adoption as well. Um, hardware is also critically important. Who's going to make the Steam machines? Um, they need big players to be able to supply the right amounts and make the right pricing. Um, and so far, we have not heard of any you know maker supporting Valve in that you know in these endeavors. Uh, they need like Acer, they need Samsung, whatever. They need like big players to come and support them to uh, to make you know make this like a, a bigger platform as well. Uh, what's very important is the pricing as well. Um, this is very much kind of an Android model where um, Steam is like Google; they own the platform, and for the makers, the only way to make money is to make money on the hardware itself. They will not make money on the games or on the Steam or anything. So. What it means for us is that those hardware is not going to be super cheap. You can't expect it to be like the PS1, uh, sorry, the Xbox One and the PS4, because those games, uh, it's kind of, you know, whole platform sell where they sell you the console for cheap, but they make money on the games, on the license and so on. So the hardware is probably going to be more expensive than what you use for console uh, so far. So uh, depending, of course, what they put inside, um, and depending as well as to what kind of games they want to run on it, uh, it's likely that, you know, that could be really like 500, 600 dollars, we don't know yet. Um, but it's likely to be more expensive than the, you know, the kind of price range we used to uh, for uh, console. At the same time, since it's kind of a free, uh, free market environment, anybody can make the Steam machines, 
it's possible that there will be additional competition and then the price will be driven down by this competition as well. So it's kind of hard to know exactly where we're going to end up, uh, but it's going to be an interesting place to be. And something that's going to be very critical uh, for Valve uh, as they grow that platform is the brand strategy. Um, you can imagine if you go into a store, let's say like, you know, suddenly the steam machines are available everywhere. <laughs> I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon, but you know, if, if it happens, like how are you going to choose a steam machine? Like if you're a, you know, random user. Um, all these machines will have like steam machine stickers on them. And you have no way of knowing, you know, what's the right machine to play with. Like maybe they have different specifications. And maybe one is better than the other to play FPS or whatever. So there's no way for the user to know what right choice to make. And we kind of back to the PC gaming system when you have to make your own configuration, you have to be knowledgeable about what you're buying. And that's a headache for people who don't care about this kind of thing. So that's going to be a threat for Valve to expand into kind of consumer space uh, as they move forward. How do, you, how do you make it easy for consumers to understand what they're buying? And they, they already announced there would be some kind of cheap steam machine as well as more expensive one. So like, how do you make sure that the user knows what they're buying and know that you know whatever they're buying is not as good to play this kind of game or this kind of game? Uh, so that's going to be a major difficulty in terms of branding. And uh, I think they really have to get their act together, especially are they working with you know different companies that will be their partners to, uh, to drive this. It's not like Sony and Microsoft, they don't own the channel of communication. So it's going to be very challenging to make sure you have you know, the same kind of uh, uniform message from all the different players in the market. But overall, I think next year when we see this machine coming out, it's going to be an exciting year because it's something very new. It's a new standard. Um, it's a new platform. And it's driven by kind of free market initiative, uh, as in like whatever you can decide to make their own steam machines. Uh, so it's, it's very new, like nobody has tried this before. So uh, I'm very excited personally to see what's going to happen and see how much traction it's going to get uh, both on the hardware and software side. And uh, now I'll wave goodbye just like Gabe and uh, I'll get to a question if you have any. <laughs> Yeah. Ah. Uh, I want to know when is Half-Life 3 going to come out? Uh, no idea. <laughs> <laughs> if I know, we don't tell you. <laughs> Do you think it's smart for Valve to go the way of releasing Steam machines as in like the Android way, which is like every single machine has the potential to have a different type of spec in it? Or would it be smarter to go, for example, the Apple way and just have one base <laughs> machine? Yeah, which, I mean, what do you imagine being like a strong position for someone, for a company that's just coming up and trying to, I guess, really, really compete in the living room? I think it's positive that they are allowing the different makers to make their own specification because um, they're letting them decide as to, you know, what kind of hardware strategy they want to have in the market. And uh, it's healthy in a way that you may be seeing some machine that you will never be seeing if they already fix specification like that. So it's interesting because some makers can decide that they can disrupt the market by making like a very, very high, high spec machine like you will never buy usually. Uh, like, you know, they have this um, development, I think, uh, Steam machine using like the Titan GB from Video, which is like $1,000 graphics card. You will never buy that really. Know, these kind of stores. So um, I'm not sure whether that's going to be even out on the market later on. That's interesting to have that option if it's there. Uh, but on top of that, if you have this kind of free specification that allows the different makers to try to make their edge in terms of you know what they market, to try to push forward the envelope uh, and and drive specification forward you know over the years. Because if you just say like you know it's going to be A, B, and C specification, you know. Who's going to say then, you know, that, well, we have to move forward two years later to a new specification? You know, it's, it's difficult to control this kind of thing because it's, in the end, it's, it developers have to make a choice as to what kind of power they need to drive their games. So it's, I, I think they're doing the right thing, but it's going to be difficult to market. Are you excited to try a controller? Definitely. Yeah. And the controller, we've, we've seen uh, a few demonstrations, we've seen a lot of feedback from uh, different users, but it's kind of still um, confidential in a way, because we haven't seen much running on it. So um, I, I don't know what to think about it currently, but we can only, I think, evaluate it correctly uh, when we try it, for real.
All right. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.